Accessibility has always been an important issue to me. At the age of four, I realized how unfair it was that my youngest sister, age eight months, couldn't play in the top bunk with my two-year-old sister and me. I vividly remember how certain I was that she would have so much fun if she could only join us, but she couldn't climb the ladder and we were far too small to lift her to the top. As the oldest, I knew I needed to take the lead on this problem. I grabbed some yarn, yes, yarn, and got to work. You'll be glad to know that I thought things through. I carefully engineered a five-point harness with multiple strands for reinforcement. Once she was secure, we looped the yarn over the railing, and I pulled while my two-year-old sister waited to help her at the top. Sadly, our mom did not have the same priorities on accessibility that I did. When she saw her baby halfway up the bunk bed held up by yarn, she immediately stepped in. She later admitted it would have worked, but she didn't initially share my vision. Well, I try to be a bit more responsible these days, my passion for enabling everyone to play hasn't waned. The ADA, or Americans with Disabilities Act, is a federal law designed to ensure that people with disabilities or who are assumed to have disabilities have the same opportunities as others. The 1991 standards gave significant protection and revisions in 2010 have improved upon that. To my knowledge, bunk beds have not yet been considered, perhaps in the next revision. The ADA means that when I use my mobility scooter, for instance, there has to be some way for me to get into a building. But that might involve going behind the building to find a ramp while others can use the stairs at the front. Universal design improves upon the ADA standards, considering accessibility needs from the very beginning. Perhaps a ramp and stairs can be side by side or features designed such that there is no need for stairs at all. Universal design for learning takes those same concepts and applies them to the classroom in multiple ways. Classes have people with differing physical abilities, but it is also important to consider the needs of different types of learners. Currently, most educational systems are set up to favor people who learn a certain way. Personally, I'm organized, my brain notices patterns, and I'm a speed reader who looks at an entire paragraph at once and intuits what it says, rather than reading things one word at a time. These things have allowed me to excel in the US educational system. What can't I do though? I am autistic and may struggle to understand social norms or why people react in certain ways. I have aphantasia and face blindness, so I can't visualize things or recognize faces. I memorize facts about visual attributes. My older kid has red hair and my younger kid loves her purple glasses. I was shocked to learn that most people can call up mental images. I don't have those. Similarly, I don't create mental maps. I can't find my way to the post office in my town of 4,000 people without looking up directions and planning a route based on the street signs. I have lived here for over 12 years. Fortunately for me, society generally forgives these difficulties. Other than a parent-teacher conference about my artistic abilities at the age of four, I've done well in school. So why is my inability to recognize someone because they dye their hair an amusing quirk, while so many view someone with dyslexia as learning disabled? I don't have answers for that, but I invite you to ponder the question. What I do know is that if we embrace learning differences, differences, not disabilities, we can create a learning environment where people have the supports they need. I'd like you to imagine you're learning how to square a number or to multiply it by itself. You see the following examples. Six squared is 36, nine squared is 81, 11 squared is 121, and so on. And while looking at these, you notice something. You ask, wait, do all the odd squares end in either one or nine? I could answer you in a number of ways. I could simply say, no, or no, think about five squared, or perhaps even, that's not what we're working on, pay attention. Or I could say, good question, let's find out. The first three answers shut students down to various degrees. For a student with math anxiety or who fears speaking in public, 
That might be the last question they ask in that class. By embracing the question, realizing that is the student's way of engaging with the topic, and working together to find the answer, they may end up with a deeper understanding of the concepts and be more likely to ask questions in the future. So we have a conjecture, a hypothesis, that all of the odd squares end in one or nine. We might take a few minutes to see if we can find patterns. Can we find a counterexample or an example that disproves our idea? We wonder, do any odd squares not end in one or nine? Wait, 15 squared is 225. So no, they don't all end in one or nine. In fact, if we can find a square ending in five, maybe we can find a square ending in any odd number or perhaps any number at all. How could we check this revised conjecture? We could try some examples, look at their last digits, and organize them. We see some ending digits match with lots of squares, while others have none. This could be the beginning of a deep discussion. I'll leave you with a hint if you'd like to contemplate the question yourself. If we could find something ending in a three or seven, how early in our numbers would we need to find it? Did we even need 20 examples? Even when students feel comfortable asking questions, a momentary lapse in concentration can lead to missing some important foundational materials. For instance, have you ever had the experience of seeing something like this, wondering for a moment whether you'll be able to see that movie with your friends over the weekend, and then it suddenly becomes something like this? <laughs> Once you've missed the steps walking through the example, it can be really hard to connect the dots, literally. <laughs> students have found recorded classes helpful when they miss a day. But many students also use the recordings as they work through their first few examples on their own or to review a concept that they didn't quite get the first time. Being able to pause the recording to think things through and try to anticipate the next steps has been a great way for some students to learn. They're learning by doing, with someone modeling the process in a way that they can review as many times as they need to. I record my classes on Zoom and share them with students in an unlisted playlist, but there are many other programs that have similar functionalities. And while I do use a webcam, it's not needed. If notes are on the smart board, that screen can be shared. I allow students to join on Zoom when needed, but it's also possible to just record your screen and audio without allowing live access to it. The ability to see something again, and again, and again, can greatly benefit students. However, there are many other supports and needs to consider. Perhaps one of the most commonly discussed issues is dyslexia, which leads to some students being unable to access the curriculum. Dyslexic students struggle to read, which is a particular issue with word problems or written instructions. My understanding of how dyslexia can impact someone has evolved over time. For instance, I switched to a sans serif font, which is a best practice for students with dyslexia. In fact, some ADA accessibility standards require sans serif fonts, including signs and display screens. Then I simply made the font larger. When I asked a dyslexic student for feedback, she pointed out that rather than larger font, it would be more helpful to have the lines spaced out so she could more easily transition from the end of one line to the beginning of the next. It was a much needed reminder about the importance of centering those with lived experience. Because I don't read one line at a time, I had never considered the importance of tracking lines like that. By changing things to a larger font, I had done little more than the equivalent of talking louder to someone who doesn't speak the language. This feels obvious to me in retrospect, but it wasn't obvious to me at the time. Much like how asking an adult to help an infant into the top bunk seems now like it might have been a better idea than using a pulley made out of yarn. <laughs> One issue that I am very familiar with myself is test anxiety. Even when I knew the material, my anxiety kept me from showing what I knew. To lessen those issues for my students, I try to focus on the purpose of the exam. I want my students to be able to demonstrate certain skills. For instance, one question might ask them to set up an equation, solve the equation, and round to the nearest tenth. Ideally, they can do all of those things. 
In practice, if a student can't set up an equation to solve, they can't show me that they can solve equations in round. Rather than a test being a high stakes, all or nothing situation, I began offering help when needed at the cost of not earning points for that particular piece of the problem. We can work together to solve the problem during the exam. It's less stressful for the student. They learn from what they see as I do it, and they are able to show me what they do know. Test anxiety is something I am very familiar with, having experienced it myself, but I only recently learned about executive dysfunction. However, it is something I've seen many times in my classroom. To continue our example from the beginning, four-year-old Dev was given a problem to solve. How can he get his sister to the top bunk? This is a fairly complex problem. The first step was to design something to keep his sister upright. After all, there was no point in building something to lift her up if she wasn't safely held and supported by the yarn. After constructing a harness, he needed to plan a way to pull her up. He wasn't strong enough to simply pull her up from the top bunk, so he needed to engineer a pulley system. Even when she reached the top, she wouldn't be able to get herself into the top bunk, which perhaps should have been a clue that this eight-month-old was not ready for this endeavor. So again, we have a problem to solve. This kind of step-by-step -step thinking comes naturally to some. They find it easy to break a task into smaller pieces, which may need to be done in a certain order. Others may need some help breaking things down. The first time I gave a group project, I gave instructions about what I wanted and a due date. I didn't realize that for many people, tackling a complex problem did not come naturally. And that is not always a step that is taught. Over time, I learned to help students by scaffolding the project, giving feedback at multiple stages, and creating online checklists that must be marked as a complete before an assignment can be submitted. Modeling how to work through a multifaceted project may be more important than the mathematics involved in the project itself. I've gotten a lot of comments from student evaluations in my 17 years of teaching, some good and some less so. Perhaps the most memorable, however, was, this was a good class. I didn't hate a second of it. <laughs> That's pretty telling. They clearly expected to hate the class, and they aren't alone. One of the most important things I can do to help people see themselves as mathematicians, or at least to hate math a little less, is to see them as individuals, to try to find the best way to support them. While there are commonalities, that's different for every person. I've been asked many times, by doing all of this, aren't you just enabling the students? My answer, yes. We are enabling students to succeed. We are helping students analyze what supports they need so they can create their own or advocate for what they need to go through life. This talk is focused on math class, but I also invite you to consider how you might take some of these ideas and apply them throughout your life. But maybe leave the yarn out of it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>